Welcome everyone to Tucson Audubon's presentation, The Birds of Ukraine, with our presenter today, Olya Phillips. Um, so Olya is going to talk to us about um, the beautiful, diverse bird life of Ukraine, as well as a little bit about the geopolitical situation in that part of the world right now and the impacts that's having on both birds and humans. Um, so uh, I just want to introduce Olya quickly. So Olya is our uh, community science coordinator here at Tucson Audubon. She started in 2015. She's been with us for a while. Uh, you may know her through our nest box program or going on bird surveys or some of our other community science initiatives. Um, I won't talk too much about it just because I know Olya uh, wants to talk about her background uh, and being from Ukraine herself. Um, so the reason we're holding this presentation today is to uh, generate donations to Nova Ukraine, which is a nonprofit that's providing humanitarian aid to the people within Ukraine uh, and those who have been displaced to other countries. Um, so I'm going to put the link in the chat here during this talk. Um, it'll also be in the email with the recording that's going out to all registrants for the event. And for those watching this uh, later on YouTube, we'll be putting that link in the video description for you to find as well. Um, so that about sums it up. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Olya uh, to introduce herself. Thank you so much, Kristen. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll head out from there. All right. Kristen, can you confirm that everything looks good on your end? Looks great. I can see your screen and not your notes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Um, this presentation was so much fun to put together. Honestly, um, this opportunity is so nice. Um, just want to make sure that I have everything in set. So thank you so much. First of all, I would really like to say I am so lucky to be working at Tucson Audubon with such a compassionate team. Um, they encouraged me to use my platform to celebrate Ukraine and share some of the resources to help provide help to Ukraine during this difficult time. Um, I'd like to read this short excerpt from the Tucson Audubon Statement of Solidarity that was shared along with the announcement for this presentation. Our ecological restoration work in the fragile and at-risk ecosystems of our area has taught us that humans both impact and are impacted by the environment in which they live. In seeking to understand the marginalized human communities of our region, we recognize the impact of invasive violence. We express solidarity with those impacted by the violence in our area and in all areas around the world. So I think that really speaks volumes in my opinion. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Olia Weekly. Uh, many of you may know me of, um, by Olia Phillips, but I recently got married and just switched over my last name. Um, I was born and raised in Ukraine. I live in two cities that are still very dear to me, the, uh, Kherson, which is the um, on the southern part. You can see my cursor here. And then Krapivnitsky, which was formerly called Kervograd in central Ukraine. At the age of 13, I moved here to United States uh, with my mom, seeking better opportunity. And I was I moved directly to Tucson. So I consider myself a desert rat now. <laughs> um, while I am a proud American now, I We'll never forget where I come from and where my family comes from and where our roots are. I still have family and friends back in Ukraine. I was lucky enough to visit back in 2019 and show my now husband where I come from. Unfortunately, a lot of my family members and friends are still there, including my niece, aunt, and cousins. So again, thank you for letting me host this talk at the end of which I will share an opportunity to benefit the Ukrainian people in this time of crisis. A little bit about Ukraine. Ukraine is actually the largest country in Europe that's 
fully within the continent. Um, it's, but it's only um, the same size as the state of Texas. Texas is huge, right? But it's still one of the states of the United States. So Ukraine in comparison is mm, smallish. The capital of Ukraine is called Kyiv. Um, we've moved away from using the Russian transliteration of Kyiv, which is K-I-E-V. We now use K-Y-I-V, which is the transliteration of the Ukrainian language. Ukraine gained independence from USSR rule in 1991, but its uh, true origin is over 1400 years old with Kievan Rus. The official language of Ukraine is Ukrainian, but a lot of people speak multiple languages there. Topography of Ukraine is mostly level with a band of Carpathian uh, mountains in the very west. We also have a major river traveling across uh, the whole country, north to south, which is called the Dnipro River. Uh, to me, the climate and topography where I grew up in the central to southern Ukraine resembles Iowa. When I visited that state, that's what it reminded me of. And that also includes the vast agricultural fields. Ukraine is actually known as the region's breadbasket for its rich soil that's really high in organic matter and very, very fertile. So the agriculture is thriving there. And you will see this theme throughout Ukrainian culture. Ukrainians are very proud of that. Many of you may have probably seen these symbols of Ukraine in the news lately. Uh, Ukrainian flag consists of two colored bands, blue on top uh, to symbolize the white sky and yellow on the bottom to symbolize the fields of wheat. Again, we're seeing that agricultural theme. The symbol in the middle of the Ukrainian is in the middle is the Ukrainian coat of arms. It is a shield and a golden trident in the middle. Many actually disagree on whether it's depicting a trident or if it's a symbol for the Holy Trinity or if it's a sim uh, symbolized. Excuse my dog, she's um, growling at something outside. But um, what most people say is that um, this symbol shows a falcon zooming downwards. So if you're looking at this, the middle part would be the tail and the, each, um, each side are these folded wings of a falcon that's um, in the middle of a dive down. And then the middle part, of course, is the body and head of the falcon. If you, um, and then of course, we have the national flower of Ukraine which is the sunflower. Ukraine does major exports of wheat and sunflower products. In fact, Ukraine produces 18% of the whole world sunflower seeds. And that includes sunflower oil, sunflower products. Vyshevanka is an embroidered shirt that's part of the Ukrainian national costume. The pattern varies by region and has different symbols meaning different things. Additionally, a flower crown with ribbon is worn by the women. When I got married last year, I also wanted to incorporate Ukrainian traditions into the wedding. So I did, I had embroidery, ribbons and flower crown among other traditional rituals of a Ukrainian wedding. Birds hold a special meaning in the symbols depicted in the traditional embroidery. Uh, they are rarely on clothes, but they're mo more often on a rushnik, which is a, an embroidered towel. For example, doves, swans, and roosters are orna ornaments of a wedding towel. It is considered the origin of a new family. And embroideries of swallows uh, signify good news, as you can see here. So what are some of the interesting birds you might find in Ukraine? Um, I wish I could share all of them. There are many um, uh, birds of Europe, birds of Ukraine. 
So I wanted to kind of share a small subset that I subjectively find interesting. Um, so I hope you do enjoy. I'm by no means an expert in Ukrainian birds, but I think they're cool. Ukraine's um, national bird is the white stork. It's uh, considered a symbol of family. After all, it is the stork that always, it's always pictured bringing um, babies to families like this little cartoon. In Ukrainian villages, um, if a stork chooses your house to build a nest on, that's considered big honor and a sign of luck to come to you. People of Ukraine are very attached to these birds. Back in 2019, the storks arrived in Ukraine and they were met with unseasonably cold, snowy March. And these, um, the locals came together to feed the birds fish and chicken uh, to provide that vital energy to survive the cold. And this story made it into the news. Ukraine's national animal also happens to be a bird. So that was national bird, this is national animal. The national animal is the common nightingale. They're very powerful singers with one of the most complex songs of all birds. Um, I'd like to actually play a short excerpt of their song for you all. And here it is. Very loud and powerful song. And so they often sing at night actually, um, hence their name. And this reminds me of our local mockingbirds that also choose to often sing at night. And this is a strategy that is thought to take advantage of the low ambient sounds during the night and much less competition for the stage to sing. Have you ever thought about what your spark bird is? Um, a spark bird is the first bird that sparked your interest in birding ever. And for me, it was the common house martin uh, back in Ukraine. And that was before I even knew anything about birding and that it could be a hobby or anything. But when I was little, we had these house martins nest in the corner of our third story apartment window. And every year they built these elaborate nests made out of mud and they would line the inside with feathers. And as a little girl, I was glued to the window like the whole time they were raising their young because you could see their little faces poking out and waiting for the parents to deliver food. My grandma, on the other hand, she was less than amused because by the end of the season, our window would end up covered in baby bird droppings. Um, but we'd clean it off and we'd host them again the following year because it was so much fun to watch. A Eurasian hoopoe is one of the birds that I've always wanted to see. They're just such a striking bird, but I haven't had a chance yet. They, um, they can be found on farmlands, orchards, grassy lawns where they feed on the ground. They kind of resemble a woodpecker, but they mostly probe the ground for insects, uh, but they do use woodpecker, old woodpecker holes for nesting. Their song is really interesting and it kind of reminds me of an owl I think we have here. It's kind of escaping me of which one, so if you do figure it out, put it in the chat, but I wanted to um, share this. Okay. Cool sound. The spring in Ukraine. <laughs> the common
common cuckoo. Okay, so this is where the cuckoos get their bad reputation from. Okay, they are they are the true nest parasites laying eggs in other species' nests for them to raise. The imposter hatchling either kicks out the other host's eggs out of the nest if they hatch first, or they kick out much smaller nestlings um, of the host species and becomes the only child. And you can see the size difference. And there's some, there's even smaller birds sometimes depicted feeding these huge cuckoos. A common cuckoo may visit up to 50 nests in a single year. Um, but some birds have um, learned to recognize cuckoo eggs, but that just you know made the evolution of the cuckoo uh, eggs to mimic um, the host eggs. So there's only certain um, hosts that they can lay their eggs in, and those um, eggs look very similar to the you know between cuckoo and the host species. It is much larger, but visually looks very similar in pattern and color. Um, in contrast, our local yellow-billed cuckoos are not para uh, nest parasites. Um, they raise their own young, and both parents take care of the nest. The adult common cuckoo resembles the marking of a Eurasian sparrow hawk, which allows them to spook the parents for a long enough time to lay the eggs and disappear. The bird on the left you see is a common cuckoo, while the bird on the right is the Eurasian sparrow hawk. You can really see that the barring on the chest, the yellow eye, and feet, really makes them look similar. And fun fact, the old cuckoo clocks that you may have seen, they mimic the call of the common cuckoo, which I'd like to play for you. I think it's such a fun sound. I think it's so much fun. But um, back in the day, the cuckoos were considered a very mysterious bird by the Ukrainian people. Um, so there are a lot of uh, superstitions around, uh, some good, some not, about associated with the bird. But I, um, I can see how they can be very mysterious. A Eurasian griffin for a, a griffin vulture is uh, such a beautiful bird. I always like to include a vulture species. I like them so much and they do such an important job for the environment by being scavenger hunting, hunters or scavenger feeders. So they're the nature's cleanup crew. They feed on the dead um, animals that have been killed by something else. Uh, the Eurasian griffin are very social. Uh, but when they feed the car on the carcass, there's a hierarchy uh, who feeds first. Eurasian griffin are long-lived species living up to 35 years old. So I would really like to see one of these one day. The great tit is a small but very hardy little bird. They spend the harsh winters in Ukraine. They don't migrate away. And the locals help these little guys by hanging up um, these pork fat ornaments, which we call sala, um, they're kind of similar to suet, where it's a very high energy food source for the birds. And these birds are actually known to dominate bird feeders. They're, they're small but scrappy little birds. Eurasian color dove, um, they're one of my favorites. They were one of my favorites to feed as a child. I know they're not native here, so they have a bad reputation, but I can't help but enjoy their song when they sing here in Tucson. It reminds me of springtime in Ukraine. And once again, <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, play that for you, the last one, I think. So 
So to me, that sounds like spring. <laughs> but now to me, spring sounds like Lucy's warbler. So, you know, it changes. There's also some species that kind of resemble each other. They might be distant cousins or not related at all. Um, convergent evolution, things like that. Eurasian kestrel is pictured on the right. Uh, it resembles the American kestrel female that you see on the left here in America. Then we've got this uh, European crested tick compared to our bridal tick mounts on the left. They're very, very similar. I had to really stare at it to see what the difference was. But it looks like the black on the um, chin is extended differently and there's some speckling on the crest as well, on the crested tip. Burrowing owls and little owl of Europe are also very similar. Yes, little owl is actually its common name. Um, I thought it was kind of funny, little owl. What's that owl? It's a little owl. Um, little owl is only a couple inches smaller than the burrowing owl we have here. They both nest and roost in burrows, but little owls also um, will use tree cavities. Of course, we can't ignore the fact of why we're all here today, right? Today marks the day 36 since the full-on attack on Ukraine. Two million people were forced to flee their homes in, uh, to surrounding countries. They might even, they might not have a home to return to once everything is over. Over 500 civilians are dead, close to a thousand are injured. Thousands of armed forces are dead. The war actually also has a tremendous impact on wildlife and the environment all over the world. It's not something we immediately thought think about, but it's the reality of wartime. Russian armed forces disturbed many nature preserves in Ukraine. Many wildfires were started with shelling and artillery. Explosions also released a lot of noxious gases into the air and bombed out wastewater treatment plants, released sewage into the waterways. So it goes without saying that the conflict is disturbing a very sensitive time for birds and other animals that would normally use this time for, in space for migration and breeding. But I like to finish on a little note of hope. Uh, people of Ukraine are resilient and compassionate and there have been good news in the animal world too. For example, during the shelling of Dnipro, one of the largest Ukrainian cities, the bat charity of Ukraine rescued a number of hibernating bats and they actually kept them in their own refrigerators to complete hibernation. And recently they were released back into the wild where they were safe. Additionally, people have risked their lives to rescue local zoos, petting zoos um, that were under heavy fire and have destroyed buildings. So the Ukrainian people need our help. I'd like to share a resource with you. I, uh, some people have already reached out to me asking for a reputable charity to contribute to. I know it can be kind of hard to navigate so many options. Um, so I, there are many, many wonderful ones doing amazing work, but I chose to, chose to list just one here. Um, Novaya Nova Ukraine means new Ukraine. They are a registered 501c3 nonprofit organization based in the United States. So everyone that donates can get a tax document for your donation. Many organizations are currently providing aid to the Ukrainian people who were forced to flee their homes to other countries. Nova Ukraine does, not, uh, does all that, plus sending aid directly into the war zone, including very vital medical aid. I know that there is a, a big shortage of medicine in Ukraine currently. Um, not only are there wounded from the war, but people's ailments don't just stop when the war starts, right? So there's still the need for um, regular medicine as well. My niece is currently in the hospital with a different health issue. 
So she experienced this firsthand. Other items they send include food, hygiene, baby care, and clothing. So all the vital things that people are actually very short on right now. The link to Novaya Ukraine is here. And I will also, it was also sent out with the link to the presentation and it will be in the follow-up. If you are interested and able to donate, please do so. I would really appreciate the help to Ukrainian people. And I know this is a short and sweet talk. I mean, you know, I hope that you enjoyed, I definitely enjoyed sharing my culture with you all. And I hope that you um, enjoyed it too. So I'm gonna, if you, if something comes up, by the way, that you think of a different question, I did list my new email, but if you have my old email, um, still, I still get those emails as well. So don't worry about that. They're not gonna get lost. I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there's any questions. Thank you, Kristen, for she posted it in the chat. So it's a clickable link for you all. Wow, thank you so much, Olya. That was incredible. I loved hearing about all of those birds. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let uh, open it up for questions for folks. I also have a couple of questions, but we'll see what questions other people have um, about anything that Olya was just talking about. Anyone wanna? unmute or uh, if you want you can put it in the chat and I can read it out loud to Olya. I'm reading all the um, comments right now they're so nice. Look the little owl haha <laughs> Trisha. That's me. Any questions? You can unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat whichever you're comfortable with. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the question in the chat from Bonnie, it says, I saw online that dogs and cats are being allowed to go with refugees. Have you heard that? Yes. So many people, when they fled their um, homes, they took their animals with them. They are also sheltering in place with their animals. So nobody was left behind. But people that are not able to take... Um, there are multiple rescues around uh, Poland and surrounding countries that are taking in those animals and, to go to their own shelters. Some of them are being held uh, to be picked up by the owners eventually, and some of them are um, going to be going to a new home. So I thought that was really nice because we all know that animals, pets are kind of members of our family. So I think it's really important to take them with us. Um, if anyone is on Instagram, there is a cat named Stepan from oh, Hard yeah. Cube. <laughs> and um, it's very sweet. And the owner uh, is of course a Ukrainian person and she's been kind of updating on how they're both doing her and Stepan. And um, yeah, yeah, it's very sweet. I heard Stepan is in France now, so he's mm -hmm. educating now. Yeah, he's apparently the most famous cat, um, Ukrainian cat yeah. on Instagram. So. Very true, and we hope that they are able to come back home soon. Um, can I stay in touch with friends and, and relatives in Ukraine? Uh, thankfully, yes, I'm able to video chat and um, message there was a time at the beginning where uh, the Russian troops bombed the communication towers in one of the cities that my niece is in. Um, and we lost uh, connection for a day or two, but we were able to gain um, connection again. So I'm able to talk to them every single day. That's great to hear. Any other questions? Any of them? Sorry, there's so many nice comments. Thank you, appreciate that. Oh, Sarah, did you have a question? I see your hand up. Oh, you're still muted, Sarah. I was wondering if there was a, a, a real ad, uh, an address that we could send a check to. That's a good question. Uh, I do believe that they do have the information provided on the website. Most of it, okay. 
Uh, Kristen, can you confirm that? Yeah, so I'm on their website now. It does say donate by mail, mail check or money order to, and they have an address that's actually in Stanford, California. And it says we cannot accept foreign outside United States checks less than 230. Okay, so that wouldn't apply because we're in the United States. So yes, there is um, an address there on the, the link that I put in the chat um, with that uh, that address you can, you can mail check. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Nice notes here, thank you. Yeah, Brian, thanks for raising your hand. Uh, hey, can you uh, hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, when the Russians started to invade from the north where they were around Chernobyl, like, and we've all known that like nature has been like uh, starting to like do a lot to recover ever since the whole uh, incident back then. How, like, do you know how much, like, since, the, yeah, when the Russians invaded, like, do you know how much damage they might have caused over there? Or, like, it, would they cr create a lot of disruption over there for, like, nature, like, having problems to try and survive? Yeah, there's definitely been a lot of, um, activity there with the Russian troops. And not only is it not safe for the people, of course, there's still containment um, in Chernobyl, but also there have been a lot of um, researchers studying the effects of um, radiation on the local wildlife in Chernobyl. Um, I know all of that study has halted. And as far as I know, there's also been um, the studies have been halted and I know that there is a, a big threat to the reactors still uh, from the Russian troops occupiers. I don't know any further than that at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's really fascinating. Like, yeah, it was like almost like 30 years since the whole incident. And a lot of people assumed like during that time, like we wouldn't expect for anything to survive there, but right now we're seeing like major, like certain species of like not only birds, but other animals from wolves, bears, deer, like animals that you wouldn't even think that could even survive, but they're thriving. Yeah. Which and I just feel kind of sad to know, like, something, even like how a war presents itself like that, they can just end up like disrupting something that was a lot people may consider a natural miracle. I agree. Yeah, it's like years in the making and the wildlife there's really thriving. I mean, and that's, that was part of the, the big study of mul on multiple species of long-term um, effects of radiation of anything that's remaining um, on the grounds there. So I hope that they can still continue, but like with Chernobyl and other nature, nature natural spaces, um, the animals are being displaced by loud sounds, by physical presence. So it's definitely not a good situation. And I see a, a question here. Since it's spring and the nesting season, how are Ukrainians protecting nests and birds? Is there a Ukrainian bird society like Audubon? So I am part of a, a Facebook group, group that's called Animal Life of Ukraine. And I see a lot of people that make it their calling to help the local birds and spread the word on the best things to do to help the birds right now. It is a very difficult time for them. Um, there's definitely bird feeders, but I imagine that not many birds are going to want to stick around in some of the hot spots around Ukraine. And the good part is that birds can fly. They can move on to a different um, part of their habitat. It'll be high stress and high competition for good nesting habitat, but I'm hoping that they will be displaced um, for a season, hopefully, and that they'll be able to come back. 
in the future. I don't know how it may, may affect some of the bigger species of mammals. Um, there's um, moose that are breeding right now as well and supposed to have calves. So that's definitely something that I think about. I can't not think about that. Any other questions? These are all great questions, by the way. I had a question about the storks. Yeah. So I'm wondering, do you know where the connection between storks and like babies comes from? Like, is that something that comes from like Ukrainian mythology or? Yeah. yeah so I actually was reading about that. I didn't know about it. I just like took it as fact, you know, I was just like, yeah, you know, they, they just chose the storks to bring babies. But actually the story goes is that someone noticed that there was a correlation between storks migrating into uh, Ukraine, for example, or other countries where they're breeding. So that would be springtime. And they also noticed that many women were having babies during that time too. So they kind of made that relation and like, oh, the storks are bringing the babies to all the women um, in Ukraine, for example. And so that kind of became a, a local folklore uh, for many years. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. You see it. Yeah, I love that. It's really cute. Yeah. Is that also in the United States? Is that also, um, okay. I see. Yeah, I honestly have no idea where it came from. I thought maybe maybe it came from Eastern Europe since okay. if the stork is the national bird of Ukraine, you know, there's, <laughs> there's significance there, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where exactly it came from, but we definitely have that myth. And we also, but I've also heard here that uh, babies were found in like cabbage patches. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, there's different myths. Yes, but you know. That is really interesting. I think yeah. there's a, a children's movie, that, an animated movie that came out like only like, I don't know, five or six years ago. That's about storks bringing babies. I don't remember oh. the name, but yeah, it was quite recent. <laughs> That's so, so much fun. I like, you know, all the um, local folklore and symbology of things. So I try to include that here. I see that a lot in Ukrainian culture. Definitely such a rich, um, like mythological, mm -hmm. like folklore, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions about um, any of the topics that Olya touched on? Um, okay, then I think we can wrap it up. Just a, a huge thank you and a virtual round of applause for our speaker, Olya. Um, that was really fantastic. Uh, I really enjoyed learning about all those birds. Um, and uh, thank you for advocating for Ukraine and bringing this to all of our attentions. And um, please, again, as Olya said, if, if you have the means uh, and the desire to do so, please please donate on behalf of Olya and behalf of Tucson Audubon. Um, and I'll include that link again in the email uh, that, that goes out with the recording uh, a bit later today or tomorrow. So um, just, just another huge thank you to all of you, to our speaker, uh, and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Olya. Thank you, Olya. That was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Olya. Thanks, Olya. You're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs>